It looks like we are alive. It is six o'clock on Monday evening, and that means that it is time for the real dialogue. I'm not sure if my connection is good on your side, but it it, it looks good on our side. Um, I'm Sivui Kotela. Um, this is the real dialogue. I'm gonna say it again. I know we say it almost every Monday. The real dialogue is an initiative of the real village. On this platform, on the real dialogue, we've got a dual, a dual, a dual mission for having this. Number one, it is to it is to capture the continent's change makers and, and celebrate them. That's the second mission. And the continent's change makers, these are people that are not only at the peak of their individual careers or platforms, whatever that is, sports. Uh, a business, um, academia, whatever it is that they do, but they realize that whatever that God has placed in their path, their career, it is there so that they could serve others. And, 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 and that is what we are celebrating basically today. We are celebrating one of the continent's change makers as somebody who has pushed, has done everything that they could to, to be on top of what, or, or, or on top of their career. And not only that, but they realize that the reason they are that successful is not for success itself to be enjoyed by them alone, but to use that success to save others, especially those that are often overlooked. And so my guest for today, I'm not going to do any further introduction. It is none other than uh, advocate uh, Tembeka Ngai Tobi Ujola, and there he is. He joins me this evening. Good afternoon, uh, 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 Advocate Ngai Tobi. Yes, good afternoon. Good afternoon, uh, Sivu. I'm very pleased uh, to be here. I've been looking forward to this ever since. You are one of the very few people who was able to press upon the Judge President uh, of the Eastern Cape. Uh, to ensure that I attend. So, <laughs> so as, as a very obedient advocate, I had to comply. <laughs> I was like, man, this guy, I, I'm not sure if, but, but, but if you speak yourself, and uh, I'm sure he will have no, it's going to be very difficult for him to say no. <laughs> I'm glad it worked. I'm glad it worked. No, it, <laughs> it, 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 I was going to come anyway, but uh, I can't say it didn't help that the JP also... Put in the sure. Sure. <laughs> sure. And I'm sure he's listening. I'm sure he's got, he's got to appear soon. He's, 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 he's watching. Well, welcome, everybody, and thank you for joining us. And as, as I've said, we've got um, none other than uh, Advocate uh, Tembeka Ngukai Tobi, SC. And uh, we'll talk about that, what that means. I mean, that's, that, that, that's incredible. Uh, the funny thing, though, about today, I, I, I've got to say it, we, we, we basically spend the afternoon together and then, and then, but we had to, I had to rush back home and so that you can also be where you are now. And it's, it's, it's very crazy. We parted so that we can meet again online. And um, I know it's the world of <laughs> Corona. I mean, in many ways it's, it's progress, but at the same time, it's, it's very odd. I know, I know, yeah. but I'm sure very soon we're going to have this. Because I was thinking to myself, as we were talking, man, this is the conversation. This conversation, what we were having uh, without people watching, you know, how organic it was, how real it was. And um, that is how I hope uh, the real dialogue is as well. That it, this is you and me talking about things that pertain to, to your life and Africa, but with people that are just happen to be eavesdropping on the on the conversation because this is I think I did say this to you. It is not meant to be an interview where I ask you where were you from? Trans guy. What is your name? <laughs> <laughs> but you know no, to just it's have a, a conversation not, as well. Yeah it's almost like uh, you know uh, uh, as Sure. Ah, <laughs> and then in uh, sure. around you know. So, so, and in fact, I had quite a lot of that this weekend because this is Lali. Yes, yes, yes. Yeah. Which is why you could come to East London now because and you you were home for the last three days. Yeah, uh, since Friday actually, I've I've been in yeah. the village since Friday. Um, we had a birthday party for my sister. 
Yeah. Um, my younger sister. Uh, well, I have one sister. Um, it's. I mean, also interestingly, because I lost two uh, aunts during COVID. Um, mm. My mother's sisters. Uh, one a direct sister, and then another a cousin of my uh, of my mother. And it was the first time since the burials, which took place in in May. It was the first time that we were meeting again um, as the as the family since they've reopened the uh, uh, mm. interprovincial travel, so called. Sure. So yeah, I, I mean, I was, you know, it was nice um, to see each other again and to you know talk about where things sure. are standing. Sure. And, sure. Know, what yeah, so that's why I've, I've been in the village. That's why I'm still in East London today. It, it feels yeah. much better than Johannesburg. I know, I know. Eh? That's why we came. That's why we came here. Thank you, man. I really, I know how busy. But if you were here, I'll tell you something. I'll, I'll let you in on the secret. Sure. If I turned the screen, and you saw my other background, which is where I'm facing right now, there is a big banner written African National Congress Eastern Cape. It just shows you. <laughs> it just shows you whose house I'm at today. <laughs> I understand. Woo, you've just given away now. Then, uh, uh, are, are you associating yourself from what is on the banner? <laughs> no, no. I'd rather not, given the today's news. <laughs> sure. I understand. I understand. Well, look, we. we we're going to be having a good one, but but look, um, we now meet um, the impactful, uh, the continent's change maker, uh, 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 advocate, uh, uh, Tembeka Ngaitobi, who becomes senior counselor, you know, at record time, you know, after eight years, and and all the accolades, the art, but it must have started somewhere. It must have started somewhere. Talk to me about your formative years. Where were you born? Um, I, you know, I mean, I, I, at first I don't know where I was born, but my mother, my, my, uh, my, my <laughs> so my mother sometimes, I think there was a point that she told me that I was actually born in Cape Town at uh, C Point where she was working at the time. Um, yeah. I, my aunt, the one who's now deceased, I think she told me the story, you know, that uh, my mother had been working there for Basically, black people in those days worked for white people, you know, as, sure. as domestics. At, at some point in her life, she once worked as a domestic uh, before she, she went down to the Eastern Cape. So when I was a baby, I was then taken to the Eastern Cape, uh, which is where I grew up. Uh, sure. The so-called trans guy had become independent then. It was sure. In, in, in whatever, 78 or whatever, I was one year old. Yes, uh, and I was taken down there, basically just raised in the in, in the transfer. So my birthplace, uh, the official birthplace, not the actual birthplace, is the trans sure. okay. And we grew up in a village um, called uh, Lupapasi, um, mm. which borders. In fact, it's surrounded by three uh, farming towns: uh, Bua towns, Dodracht, uh, Indwe, and sure. uh, and Elliot. Um, sure. In fact, the village itself is probably 15 minutes away from the, the farming town of Indre. Um, sure. And so I went to primary school there in an old Methodist school. Uh, the, the Methodists had been the first to arrive in that village and to set up a church uh, in 1898. Uh, they, if you go there, there is a, a stone structure. Uh, set up by the Methodists in 1898. Um, so it had been one of the very first mission stations, uh, as it were, built in the uh, in the late 19th century. Mm. And they also set up a school as well, uh, because if anyone has had anything to do with the, the history of the Eastern Frontier, they would know that a church always went with, uh, with education uh, as part and parcel of the civilizing mission, um, mm. coming all the way from the... Sure from the uh, uh, arrival of the Christian missionaries uh, from 1798, etc. So, so I was born there, raised there, taken to primary school in those uh, 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 Methodist schools. And um, um, yeah, so those were my, I mean, I, I don't know if those are really formative because I mean, the, the formative is itself a spectrum, you know, it's not a particular 
isolated sure. event, uh, sure. but it's certainly one of the you know uh, early stages. Uh, I went to church. I was baptized, uh, uh, made a Christian. I have a baptismal certificate. I have even a Christian name, you know, um, which is <laughs> for those. Who What's the Christian name to me? Uh, it's it's Nicholas. <laughs> uh, well, you know, mine is, mine is not very. I'll tell you something though. I mean, now that this is a fireside chat, it's not a real interview. When I turned 18 uh, in 95, 96, somewhere there, anyway, when I turned 18, I actually wanted to change the, uh, the Christian name. I, I, I wanted to go to Home Affairs and remove the name. You know? So, sure. so that my name is just, I've never actually used it. So my name has always been Tembeka. Sure. But then I asked my mother, you know, like, what's up with this name? You know, like, why do I have uh, this? this uh... At the time, we called it because I was still, you know, get new into the revolutionary thing. It was like, why do I have yeah, a slave yeah. name? Sure. And then she says, no, 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 it's actually not a slave name. It was a name given to you by your grandmother. So I said, but it's still a slave name. He says, no, it's because you were born on Christmas Day, and it's, as you know, St. Nicholas, you know, the first father of Christmas. Sure. Sure. And, and then I thought twice about changing it. I just thought, okay, well, at, perhaps at least as homage to my grandmother, let me sure. keep it. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> and it is a, 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 a true Christian name in your case. Mine <laughs> is very far from, mine is far, I mean, my, my name, I don't even know if I should mention it, because I normally, say, my, I normally say Sivuile M, Cordella, and then, but my my I, I don't know what's Christian about it. My 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 second name is McDonald. McDonald, wow! <laughs> I know. <laughs> <laughs> I think the best I can say about it is that it's English, because the you McDonald's know, exactly. it's so meaningless. Did the McDonald's then, come from Scotland? I mean, they, yeah, exactly. They come from Scotland, and maybe they were one of the Scottish missionaries. But 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 it, it even gets even crazier. But we're not talking about me now. It even gets even more crazy. As I was checking, you know, my 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 lineage, my my, my surname, there is a Cordella presence in Scotland. But that's oh, just wow. crazy. But we'll talk about one day when I'm when I'm being in, you know interviewed. I'll talk about that. Yeah, but yeah, me now. <laughs> so I think it's probably the Scottish connection. So it's not that far from Christianity. You know, yeah. Yeah, but hey, I, I'd, I'd rather keep Sivuile. And 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 you, you did mention you did mention that you've got siblings as well, and uh, your younger sister and um, your brother. I'll talk to yeah, you about your yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, I mean, you know, my, m many people know my brother. Um, he is a full-time practicing politician, uh, and my sister um, works for the government um, in. Uh, the Department of uh, Higher Education and Training um, mm. in Pretoria. Yeah, so, so. yeah. And so, and then it's my mother, uh, and so. then obviously children, my brother, etc. Yeah. In fact, so. um, as if, if you had been here uh, earlier, for those of you who are watching, they would have seen two kids walk, walk in via that door. Mm. Yeah. And uh, <laughs> those were, those were, those were, those were <laughs> my yeah, kids. Cause them trouble as usual. <laughs> so, so. No, the uncle is around. The uncle is around. Exactly, so because I'm in the building. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> and no. uh, then, yeah, then it's my mother and um, my uh, my grandmother passed on in 2013. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Look, tell me, tell me, and, and of course we will we, we we will do you know the connections later on about your dad. Um, but but had it, I mean, what kind of a, of, 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 a, of a, a student were you growing up? High school, primary school? Yeah, you know, I mean, in uh, in in like when I started, we still had sub A's um, at yeah. the time. Um, I actually was a bright kid in some respects, uh -huh. I mean, but in, in other respects, a naughty child, you know, who was lazy and didn't work hard, etc. you know, and when I did apply myself, you know, the, the results were usually very good. But uh -huh. I suspect that, because the, the teacher who taught us at, at the sub A was a, a woman called Mrs. Mkumatel. I suspect uh -huh. that the reason I passed uh, those classes quite easily was because she was a friend of my mother. Um, so I, I, I don't think it's, I don't 
<laughs> so, so, so I don't think it had much to do with me. But I think where I really, really started thinking straight about school, um, because for the most part, I, I went to school because it was compulsory for us to go to sure. school. You had sure. no choice but sure. to go to school. Sure. And I mean, one day I'll invite you to my village. Literally, it's split by a road uh, between, you know, the red people, as my grandmother called them, you know, uh, sure. Ababo, yes. and, uh, and, the, and the Christian converts, Amakabo. So my, my father's family, you know, came from the red people and my mother's family came from, you know, the, uh, the, the converts, uh, Amakabo. Mm -hmm. And, and my, my grandmother never forgave us for that. And she, mm -hmm. she constantly reminded us <laughs> about where we came about where, where we came from. And so, so on the Christian side, in other words, on the, uh, on the convert side, yeah, school was compulsory. Uh, there was just no option. You had to go to school. It was just like eating, you know, like breathing, sure. something sure. that you had to do. Yeah. yeah. Um, so, 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 so it's not like I had an interest in school myself, but that interest grew up later uh, on me, but I, I had to go to school because that was, you know, what had to be done at the time. But much later, when I was in high school, uh, at a school, <laughs> interestingly known as Matanzima High School, you know, known mm -hmm. after Matanzima himself. Yes. Then I really started enjoying school. I really started enjoying certain subjects that I was studying. And I really started applying myself. And my marks exponentially uh, increased. I moved sure. from a 60% student to an 80% student. And sure. I really started getting excited when I got a script and I saw that I was the top in the class, etc. Sure. But sure. I think pretty much before then, I, I went to school because it was part and parcel of a duty yeah. to, to get educated. Yeah. yeah. And, 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 and yeah. We've, we, I don't know how to phrase this, uh, but let, let me start by saying, had it had it not been law, what was the second? What was the other option? You know, growing up, what did you want to become? You know, it's interesting. I actually never thought of anything else. I really just mm -hmm. never did. The first time I thought of studying law was when I was six. You know, and I just never thought of studying anything else. It's wow. only when I applied at metric when I was applying to universities, and they give you three options. Yes. <laughs> And then <laughs> I remember this. <laughs> and, and then so you put no at the top and then you think around, yeah, then, okay, let me put journalism. Yeah, you're hoping, you're gonna, you know that I have to yeah. go to. Yeah. So those were all like random choices, you know, like, okay, maybe I should become a journalist, maybe I should become a teacher, you know, maybe mm -hmm. I should become mm -hmm. something else. But they were really, really random. The only thing I always wanted to study when I, I was six was law. I really never had anything else. I, you know, that's it's the strangest thing because actually my mind was made up from the beginning. Was this, and, 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 and of course, uh, others would notice that you did not mention your, when you were talking about your family, um, your, your, your father. And yeah. um, bless, his, bless his memory. And, um, and um, he did pass. Uh, he did die while you were young. And, yeah. uh, and, then, and then the interesting thing, and we're talking about this afternoon. Is that is that you discovered that when he died, he was actually studying law? Yes, of course. Yeah, I mean that's why he's the reason yes. I, I mentioned him is just because he's no more. Yeah, I mean yeah. this was you know I was six at the time. I, I, this is a, yeah. one of the few living memories about my my, my father. I, I don't have any other memories. I, you know, there are vague recollections of actually seeing him or meeting him because he didn't stay with us. Uh, the story is that he, when we were born, he was working, when I was born, certainly, he was working sure. in the mines of Johannesburg as a, as a yeah. mine worker. Much later, he got a job in the Transkai in the magistrate's court, either in Tsomo or in Tsofimba, but one of the two magistrate's court, as a yeah. clerk. And when he died, uh, he was a clerk in Tsofimba or Tsomo, and he had matriculated and he was studying his first year BUS uh, sure. degree via UNISA. Mm. My brother actually showed me his certificate a couple of years ago, um, later when I had already qualified as a, wow. a, a attorney. My brother showed me his first year courses where he had studied Latin mm. and studied Roman law 
the Roman law, mm. criminal law. But the, 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 my own direct recollection of my encounter with the idea of law was shortly after his death, um, I think Mr. Senza is Zila. Sure. Uh, is it like a year later, you know, sure. uh, traditional sort of yes. uh, memorial. Yeah. yeah. And I went through, so they were giving away his clothes and his possessions and belongings. Sure. And in the room that he used to use, which basically we were banned from, you know, going into uh, for right. a long time. You never know, oh. you know, this black families, there's no span, you know, no, children are not allowed in this room. Puma, <laughs> puma. <laughs> exactly. Puma, puma, puma. <laughs> so, so, so. so in one of those rooms, you know, that were completely like off limits. Uh, on this day in question, I walk in and the two items that struck me uh, was a thick book. It was black. Uh, but very thick and heavy. Yeah. And only now, much later, I realized that what was written on the cover was a criminal procedure law and law of evidence. And the book mm. is written by Butcher, mm. uh, Professor Butcher. And then there was another book which was read in cover, and I've now lost that book. I actually kept it very close to my chest. It was a book on cross-examination. Uh, sure. But I didn't know about both of these at the time. So I asked my mother what, what books were these because the one book looked like the Bible. Um, yeah. And the, yeah. Of course, now I mean now that I'm a lawyer, I see many books that look like the Bible. But yeah, of <laughs> <laughs> but what struck me about that was that it really just looked like the Bible because the only sure. book I you know knew commonly was the Bible because you had to carry sure. it to school mm. etc. So I then asked my mother, you know, what book is this which looks like the Bible? And then she says, no, 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 this, this is your father's book. So I said, well, why does my father have a book that looks, but it's not actually the Bible? And then she then tells me that it's because uh, he was studying to become a lawyer at mm. the time of his death. And it's really from that moment that I, you know, I mean, I don't know to sound uh, sexist or anything, but I think boys have something about basically achieving the things that their fathers couldn't achieve. Sure. I mean, I, I hope this is wrong. I hope girls also have that dream, but I'm talking from my perspective as a young boy. Sure. Um, that I, from that moment, I really wanted to achieve what my father couldn't achieve. Uh, sure. I, I wanted to do it for him. Mm -hmm. um, but at the same time, I wanted to do it for myself. And, sure. and that's why, I, I never had a thought of doing any other thing, you know, mm, other than that makes know, sense. My yeah. latest role model is my father, so that's the thing I need to do it for 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 him. I mean, you know, somebody asked me, so why are you still doing it now? I mean, <laughs> so, so I <laughs> you know what? You know what? Let me tell you. Let me tell this you something. Is on. Yeah, man. <laughs> let, me, let me tell you something, uh, 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 John. Uh, I'm, 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 I mean, you know, I'm, I'm a father of two boys, uh, Mangaliso and Bantu. And it is true what you're saying. And by the way, and, and I, I do need to, 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 to affirm, um, there's something about, 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 about us fathers as well. And um, I look at my boys, um, the greatest compliment that, that they could give me is when they want to be like me. You know, if they say, you know, daddy, I want to be, like, I mean, there's no better compliment than that when your son wants to do what you do, when, when your son wants to be like you. But at the same time, while that is complimentary and I love it, but at the same time, as a father, I want them to be much more better than I am. Yeah, and, absolutely. And, I mean, and, I, and, and, I, and that is, and, and I was saying to you this afternoon, not only, I mean, it would have been an honor enough for you to be a lawyer. But you, you are not just a lawyer. You are not just a good lawyer, but you are an embodiment of black, of African excellence. And your brother I mean, and your father would be very proud of you. And I'm proud of you, man. Yeah, thank you. No, thank you. And I mean, yeah. to, your other, to your earlier point, I mean, this is, this is really a wonderful point that you make there, which is that we have a, a, a responsibility that transcends our immediate interests and we don't sure. obviously realize this and we don't you know live out according to this because there's a lot of pressure in the idea of role modeling you know sure. Uh, sure. because role modeling itself takes you away from your own projections mm. because mm. it's conscious of external expectations 
Sure, and sure. internal expectations themselves may impose additional pressures. Mm. But let's face mm. it, there are very few of us, right? And there are very many people that have expectations and therefore they are watching. So we shouldn't sure. run away from whether we have put ourselves in the position of role modeling. Mm. We are perceived as role models. Mm. Mm. Not because we've chosen to become role models, sure. but because in the absence of examples you know, of fatherhood, examples of leadership, examples of excellence, then we get mm. to fill the void. You know? sure. And with sure. that ability to fill that void, then comes the additional responsibility. Mm. I mean, in my own case, I had this sort of imaginary lawyer who was my father. Sure. But it would have been much better when I grew up to feel, to touch, to hug, to greet, to speak to a lawyer, mm. you know, mm. on a tangible level, to sure. get someone who is black who looks like me, mm. you know, who I can say to you, my dream is to become a lawyer. Because I remember this much later when I had a, another conversation with my mother at the point at which I had to choose university, apply, etc. And my mother's view was, why don't you just do something that will give you a job immediately? What do you know about the law? <laughs> Now, yeah. I mean, obviously at the time I was a bit annoyed, you know, with it. Like, you know, what's this woman up to? Doesn't she know that I want to be like my father? Mm. You know, <laughs> but, but the problem was that there is no one that is tangible, that is visible, that we can touch, feel, mm. hug, you know, mm. who can put us on the path. Mm. Now, that's the void we've inherited and we are occupying as the. Mm sort of transitional generation, the people sure. that become adults, you know, after 1994 and sure. in the face of like the massive demand for, sure. for, for examples, you know, I, I get invited many, many times to many uh, schools, to universities, etc. Although sometimes I go to talk about land or I go to talk about freedom of expression or I go to talk about the constitution, et cetera, the subjects that I, I, I practice. What I always find is that at the end of each lecture is a queue of black students, uh, male or female. They obviously want to know more about the law, but they also yeah. want to chart the path for themselves. Mm -hmm. And their view is, well, when we look at you and your background, we see that you've been able to make it. We also believe that we can make it. Mm -hmm. you know? And that's not something I've decided I'm going to do. Sure. That's something they have decided, that they need someone mm -hmm. to look up to. And then in their own wisdom, maybe lack of wisdom, they decide that this is going to be me. That they will. Mm -hmm. And so that's why I, I think it's absolutely crucial, the work you are doing, you know, which is, to talk about people's stories. I mean, those are the stories I also am interested in. It's, it's, sure. it's, it's really the, the, talking about the person, the story, you know, uh, sure. Sure. That, that ultimately enables us to realize our own uh, uh, potential. So it's, it's really brilliant. I, it's, I, I think there are very few, you know, uh, people who do this sort of work. And yeah. I mean, it's not like I'm gonna dish out money, but <laughs> Yeah. It's still more much more valuable than teaching out money. Sure. It's yeah. basically yeah. the idea that it can be done. Sure, precisely, precisely. You couldn't have said it better. You couldn't have said it better. You know, this quotation, I mean, when we excel, we give others permission to do the same. And um, and, and 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 when we excel as black people, we give black children permission. Um to do the same and 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 thanks for that man and um and and like i said you 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 really have honored your 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 dad's memory very well we cannot transition without speaking about your work and i was thinking to myself hey i, I need to speak uh, look primarily of course you are a lawyer and but you are also an author and yes. you are also in the academic space as well and um, yeah. you know presenting and writing papers and even an adjunct professor. Maybe let's start with that. You are currently an adjunct professor of law at both uh, Nelson Mandela University and, um, and UCT. Are you enjoying that? Yeah. You're enjoying teaching? <laughs> yeah, it, it's, it's very interesting, actually. Uh, I also guest teach at WITS. Yes, yes. And uh, I, I had a, a, a lecture the other day in, sometime in August. Uh, I was teaching collective labor law. And everyone was transitioning into the 
COVID, COVID arena. Yeah, yeah. Now, the reason why this is interesting, the, uh, the guest teaching and the, the, the associate professorship or ajang professorship yeah. as, they, as they call it, is because it allows me space to reflect on the practical sides of the law from an academic angle. Mm. Mm. Because mm. as practitioners, we are in the business of doing what we can to win a case, right? Ensuring you act within the bounds of ethics and the bounds of law. But sure. your primary responsibility is to win a case, you know, sure. um, when you are a lawyer. But when I find that I'm teaching, my responsibility is even to impart knowledge about the argument I was opposing, mm. right? to show mm. its strengths as well. Sure. Because the student wants the benefit of both arguments. Whereas sure. as a lawyer, you try to expand on your good arguments sure. and you try and minimize the strength of your opponent. Sure. But as a lecturer, it's much more discursive and reflective at the same time. Mm. Mm. And I found that transition more fascinating I'm because sure. there's no position you are advancing. Sure. You are presenting sure. both positions. Mm. You're trying to present both positions in the most dispassionate uh, way. But there's also something about, uh, and I must say this, most of us practicing lawyers assume we can lecture because we are constantly lecturing judges. You know, mm. we think the judges don't know that they're going to lecture. Yeah. But the judges actually know more than we do, but we think sure. we do know more than the judges. Mm. But they are judges because they know more than we do. Sure. But when it comes to the lecturing space, and that's another fascinating observation I've made, there's something called uh, pedagogy, which is sure. the ability to transmit knowledge. Sure. Not many of us have that skill. This mm. is a pedagogic skill, mm. right? Sure. And it can be learned and it can be taught. Sure. So although you know the concept, the question is whether you can translate it to someone sure. else who doesn't know sure. the concept. Sure. Now that's not the same thing as trying to tell a judge that you are right. Mm, and there is mm. something in that skill that many of us still need to learn because yeah. you will find that you've spoken to students for an hour and you ask them what you were talking about in the past hour and then you realize that it's actually chalk and cheese. You, you, mm -hmm. you know, it's as if you put sure. different planets. You know, sure. so... And <laughs> that's what you. Thought, you know, <laughs> it's the fault I'm of the lecture. <laughs> I'm with you. I, I feel you now. But but tell me, tell me, and um, what is most what is most fulfilling in terms of because when you are guest lecturing or adjunct, uh, you know, um, as, as it were, um, sometimes you 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 don't get to 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 grow with your students. You know, you see them and then you come. Uh, um, and then meet another batch of 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 students. Um, does that is that something that is missing, or or do you get to have relationships with your students now as as as, as an adjunct lecturer? Do do you get to have an ongoing you know relationship yeah. with them? Yeah, I mean yes and no. I mean so a, a full time lecturer has a much more intimate. I mean I mean academically yeah. intimate relationship. Sure. Uh, with, yeah. <laughs> so as, as, let, me, okay, let me not use the intimate. It's a closer relationship. <laughs> I understand. And, and so they see them transition from sure. fresh out of high school into sure. young adults, you know, who can be sent into the field of law and practice. But the space I occupy is usually at a master's level, you know. So I would go uh, and I was guest teaching. Yeah. Okay. Uh, I was guest teaching in the law, uh, the, the human rights course, the collective labor course at WITS, but both of which were LLM students. Sure. But to your point, I mean, I've met a lot of them subsequent to their LLM classes. Now look at a guy who comes up to me and they basically start chatting away. Like, okay, so who are you now? And then they say, <laughs> so, 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 so. so then they say, no, in 2016, I think I probably started in 2016. So in 2016, 
you taught in my master's uh, class and you spoke about X and I then subsequently went to do more research on the wow. area. And, and I mean, you look at this thing and you're like, wow, because mm -hmm. you are always self-conscious. I mean, certainly sure. I am. I don't know about other people. Maybe other people have got more confidence than I do. But I'm always very self-conscious about teaching or even about arguing a case, about anything that I have to like, get onto the stage and perform. Very yeah. self-conscious about whether I am appearing to be mastering the subject or yeah. I'm bumbling around. Sure. I always sure. fear that, you know, at some point, someone is going to catch me out that sure. I'm bumbling sure. around. Sure. <laughs> so, sure. so, so, so when for five years after the encounter with a student, and they come to you and they say, I was so interested in what you said. I've done mm. a full research on it. Here's my paper. Wow. At that point, wow. it all becomes worthwhile. And I'll tell wow. you something else about, about the academic versus the, the, the field of practice. Because, yeah. you know, I, I, I tried to, 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 is that if you ask many, in fact, I asked this a senior lawyer who retired in 2017, and so I went to buy his library. Um, he was a professor at WITS, but he was also a senior counsel. I went to buy his library. And I asked him the question, what did he find the most interesting in his life as a lawyer? Yeah. He said he found the most interesting thing, the book he wrote on labor law. I said, how about the hundreds of cases that you argued? He says they were interesting at the moment. But as soon as I left court, they stopped being interesting. Wow. And it's actually true wow. is that once you leave court, what is interesting is the next case, not the case you've just argued. You know, it's the next case that becomes interesting. Mm -hmm. But if you produce a paper, an academic piece, it's durable and lives much longer and becomes a source of reference for mm -hmm. more conversations sure. and debates and sure. articles. And sure. So sure. a project like a book, for instance, you know, yeah. has a much longer lifespan, you know. Sure. Uh, people read, debate it, criticize it. It teaches them something. Maybe it doesn't. But its lifespan is much longer. So in the end, you know, although the life of practice is much more lucrative, very exciting, and in many respects meaningful in the sense that someone who is arrested can be released because you've made representations on their behalf. In terms of its own durability and longevity and its lifespan, it's quite limited. We, we, we do one case at a time, you win that case or you lose that case. But the truth is that you move on, you move to the next client after that. Sure, sure, sure. Now, now, now speaking, about, speaking about the longevity of, 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 of books, uh, how bold was that? The land is ours. <laughs> <laughs> Congratulations! That that is a bestseller. Absolutely has transformed the narrative, and we are actually building as the Real Village. We are putting together a list of first hundred books must haves across the continent and in the diaspora that every African should read, and that book is part of that list. Wow, and, thank you. Thank you, man. Thank you for your for that. How did that go about? I, I mean, was that a burden of yours that you know I, I need to research the, uh, the, the, this topic? Yeah, I mean, it, it, in many respects, it was. So the latest hours basically covers three primary themes. So the first theme is the disposition of Africans of land, sure. and it uses the Eastern frontier as the entry point into the story of the disposition of Africa, of land by, by European uh, settlers, uh, European conquerors or European thieves. Yeah. Uh, but the key to it was that it linked the disposition part, the theme of disposition was that it linked the three central themes of disposition. Sure. It linked land to culture mm -hmm. and to labor. And those are the three elements of disposition that have been the most durable and have completely transformed the relationship between Africa and Europe sure. and have rendered Africa the vassal through which the Europeans 
can play out their fantasies. So, mm. and the cultural part was crucial in the larger story of dispossession mm. because the cultural part comprised of two elements. One was religion, the other was education, mm. but both of which were two sides of the same coin of the cultural dispossession. It's forgetting who you are and then putting something else in your head. Mm. The mm. key mastermind towards the cultural imperialism was Sir George Gray. He made the announcement quite clear in 1854 when he opened the Cape Parliament that his idea was of an African who was in awe of the European culture and completely submerged in its superiority. Hmm. And everything he did from then onwards from Gray, essentially, right up to Cecil, Cecil John Rhodes in the 1890s, who also became Prime Minister of the Cape, was part and parcel of the cultural genocide. The best place to learn about cultural genocide is in the Eastern Front. It's the conversion of large numbers of Africans into civilized men. So civilization was the essential vehicle through which cultural, uh, the cultural genocide was practiced. The second element was labor. Black people did not need to work for white people. The Tossas did not need to work for the English. But once they had lost cattle and had been defeated in war, in order to perfect the loss of cattle and the defeat in war, they had to be converted into wage laborers. Again, that was the vision of Sir George Gray, because he realized that natives were self dependent. They produced their own food and they fed themselves through their own labor. But the only way to integrate them into the colonial economy was to take the land and to take the cattle. And that mm. would force them off the land into selling their labor. And mm. the first major project was road constructions. They had to build all the roads connecting the Eastern Cape to the Western Cape. I mean, mm. the railway lines of the Western Cape were built by African labor. Mm. And this all happened after 1878 because there was mm. massive starvation in the Eastern Cape after 1878, right? And the only way that people could survive from that starvation was if they allowed themselves to be essentially wage laborers. And of sure. course, many of us remember the story of Nongaus. Nongaus yeah. also produced massive starvation in the Eastern Frontier. And literally, children were being given away. You know, mm. if you were not dying from emaciation and hunger, you were literally being given away to mm. build up the, uh, the, the British Empire. And then the third element, which we tend to focus, focus a lot on, it, was the disposition on land. But it's mm. only when you see the three interconnections that the term I used in the book is the totalization. Colonialism is a total strategy. You know, it's the full subjugation. The second theme of the land is ours was to look at the initial legal responses to conquest. And this is a fascinating thing because that's where I looked at individual biographies. And the mm -hmm. reason this becomes most fascinating is that if you had come to the Eastern Frontier, say in 1820 or in 1850, Africans would have resisted education, they would have resisted uh, Christianity, and they would have done so through the taking of arms. Everybody remembers Malcolm, the mm -hmm. greatest war general who survived four frontier wars, right? Until his eventual capture and he was sent to Robben Island. But the Tosas would have resisted it. Everybody remembers the story of Sakhili. You know, mm -hmm. Everyone remembers the story of him, so they decapitated him. But those guys actively resisted. But if you came back in 1890, right, there would have been no resistance. Instead, there would have been an initial acceptance of Christianity. People would have gone to school, would have acquired education. Mm. But it was through the use of that education that they began to think of new ways of approaching the empire. Because sure. they could no longer do what Nguyen did. I mean, Nguyen was in Graham's time in the so-called Eye of the Octopus in 1890. He thought he could basically organize an army of 6,000 people and they would run over the British. But he realized mm. that it was not working because of uh, what they call Ifagadol. You know that mm. thing where you put a bomb thing, you put it, and then it blasts a hundred people all at once. You know mm. exactly. So he realized that the complete uh, the defeat of 
the British is not possible because they've got arms, you know. And of course, the Tosas were deeply divided, you know, on yeah. both on the Nuka uh, and the Tamba side. I mean, there's deep internal divisions there. But ultimately, the power of the gun, you know, was not going to make it possible to defeat them. So mm. if you came in 1890, there would have been no similar resistance. People would have gone to school. But there is another fascinating thing about this, is that if you came in 1850 and you went to the church as a Tosa speaking person, you would have been regarded with suspicion by your fellow Tosa men. Mm. They would have regarded you as a sellout. Mm. But if you did that in 1890, they would have understood that you have to do it because that's the only way of survival. So the mm. interesting bit is that the ANC is founded in, okay, some people say 1912, but there's lots of evidence that in 1908, actually the ANC had been founded and actually it was all here in the Eastern Cape. Now, mm. the ANC is founded by Christian African men. People 100 years earlier who would have been regarded as sellouts are now perceived 100 years later as liberators. Mm. Samuel was a Christian. Mangena mm. was a Christian. Simang was a Christian. All of the mm. men who were at the founding conference of the ANC. So it's looking at that point at which there was a transition through the use of Christianity and education and then beginning to think of ways in which the empire could be challenged. And the last theme of the land is ours is constitutionalism. And the big problem or the big bugbear of, uh, that drove me to write the book on constitutionalism is the idea that the constitution is a Western Eurocentric document cooked sure. in Africa and then sure. given to us. And to show its African anti-colonial origins. Mm. In relation to those three primary aims, I think that the book has received a measure of success. Um, sure. I was told recently that uh, there's a lecturer at UWC who's prescribed it, another lecturer wow. at, uh, at WITS who's prescribed it. So mm. it's doing its work in that sense. But a book is never complete. It's, sure. it's, it's hard to think that it's never complete. There are always gaps in a book. Sure. And sure. any author who's worth their salt knows that a book has to be published at a certain point in time because sure. there's a published sure. deadline. Yeah. You know? <laughs> so, so, so. so a lot of those themes are still being pursued. Uh, the land mm -hmm. theme is coming up again in another book I'm publishing in February 2021. We have got to speak about that one. We've got to speak about that one. You've decided to look into the trial, the tragedy of... Uh, uh, the trial of, of, of Robert Mangalisa Sobukwe. Yeah. How is that? How is, how, how, how is that? How is the process? A, a, any, any, of course, you don't want to give, you know, give much away and uh, before we buy the books, uh, the book next year, but, but, but uh, any things that you discovered, like, man, this is an aha moment for me. I didn't even know this and we have not been told this. It's not public knowledge. Of course, so yeah, much I mean, of those. I, okay, let, let me tell you something about the, 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 I mean, look, I mean, so, so there are many ways of looking at Sobukwe, right? And I don't think anyone can claim, um, can claim Sobukwe more than others. Um, one of the things that have fascinated me about finding out about, uh, about Sobukwe is, you know, someone goes to Robben Island, right? And unlike the, you know, and, and this is not a criticism uh, for, for Mandela supporters. Uh, I'm also a, a big Mandela fan, by the way. So Anna Mandela and the ANC comrades who are sent into sort of communal cells, Sobukwe is singled out and he stays in a, an isolated cell, which on its own is pretty traumatic. The, the isolation, you know, it's, it's a pretty traumatic thing. But what happens in parliament at the same time because, mm. you know, he's been sent to Robben Island for, mm. he's been sentenced to three years uh, sure. in prison and sent there to you know, serve that period. But as soon as he arrives there, a debate starts in parliament, spearheaded by racists like Persa, you know, who basically say, we've got a terrible man here and mm. it, we can't release him. And parliament has to debate what to do with mm. Robert Kabuka. Mm. And one of the people that's spearheaded the debate about Sobukwe's release is uh, Helen Sussman um, mm. from, I think it was the Progressive Party, but basically yeah. a, a white liberal party of the time. Yeah. And Sussman's suggestion about the release of Sobukwe is that 
Our law does not recognize incarceration by executive dictat. Our law recognizes incarceration only through a judicial process. So mm -hmm. employing sort of liberal uh, uh, legal discourses, but for a progressive cause. Sure. The response is most fascinating. This uh, the response is, and and then the argument is made, and this is this is most interesting. The argument is then made that if you still want to monitor Sobukwe, you should put him in administrative exile. And a comparison is then drawn with uh, 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 Chief Albert Lutuli. They say mm. Chief Albert Lutuli would put him in an internal administrative exile, and that was effective in terms of silencing him. So why don't you do the mm. same? You know what the response is? Mm. Says Sebukwe is the most dangerous man in South Africa. He cannot be compared to anyone. We cannot employ a strategy that has been used for uh, Lutuli in order to deal with Sobukwe. But why exactly was Sobukwe so dangerous to the National Party regime? Now, this becomes interesting on an intellectual level on its own, because it turns out that what they feared the most about Sobukwe is that although the anti-apartheid movement opposed racial discrimination in favor of non-racialism, they still accepted the paradigm of race, right? Sure. They accepted the paradigm that establishes South Africa as four, mm -hmm. whatever. Sometimes it was three races, sometimes it was I four. Right. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> we've eventually settled on, on four. You know? yeah. But everybody had accepted. But that paradigm is a paradigm drawn up by the nationalists mm -hmm. under the separation of the, the Separate Representatives uh, Act. So that's when they were separating the different races in order to decide who has the right to vote and who has no right to vote. That is 1950. And the anti-apartheid movement, on the other hand, accepts that paradigm, mm. but argues for equality, but within mm. a racially segmented society. Mm. Mm. And some of brilliance ah. is the place of the paradigm. Mm. <laughs> ah, <turn back. laughs> I love that. Mm. <laughs> Take your time, sir. Take anyway, your time. We'll, yeah, we'll, we'll find more time to talk sure. about this. So Don't hold me to any deadlines, by the way, because there's the only one race. Yeah. There's only one race, human race. Precisely, exactly. That's the brilliance. That is the mm. ultimate fear. Mm. Wow. Yeah. And, 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 and your feelings about, I mean, I don't need to ask you if you think he is being honored enough. Um, and I, I don't need to answer you. I mean, the, 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 the answer is, too, is, is very clear. Yeah. Uh, but, and, uh, but your feelings about that? No, I mean, Sobukwe is clearly not being given the due recognition that he, he deserves. I mean, and there are two facets to, well, maybe three facets to him. There's like the man. I mean, it's the, the idea of being at Robin Island and, and sitting through all of them. I mean, you know, I, I didn't know that Sobukwe actually had a, an economics degree. He finished an economics degree through the University of London whilst he was at Robin Island. I, I had not been aware of that, but uh -huh. I, I found his actual script, you know, where he's, he's <laughs> submitted this and he's, he's actually passed. And, and so we also uh, finished uh, his law studies. He became an attorney and he actually practiced. And one of the things, I mean, I, I hope, I, I just don't have it now, but I was just going to share it on the screen because I also found his actual letterhead, R.M. Sobukwe Atenis. You know, that, wow. that was the law firm he ran in Kimberley. You know, it's R.M. Sobukwe. And the, wow. and the judge who admitted Sobukwe was a, a woman called Leonora van der Heven. She's also fascinating because she was the very first female judge in South Africa, admitted in 1969 as a judge. Mm. And Sobukwe became an attorney, I think, in 1977, in, sometime in May 1977. Wow admitted in Kimberley by Leonora van der Heven. And these are interesting coincidences about you know, his life. Now, I mean, so that story about Sobukwe, the lawyer, you know, is an unknown story. What kind of cases did he do? What kind of man was he? Who did he represent? What was it like to listen to Sobukwe in court? What was it like to go to his wow. office to him mm. and to, sure. you know, for him to take your case and to argue it, you know. Those are stories we don't know about because 
we are pigeonholed into so the politician mm. but when you humanize him you get a totally different picture of uh, sure. Sobukwe. Sure. There is a, a fascinating thing, uh, which, I mean, again, don't hold me to deadlines because this is a very important book to be rushed. <laughs> there, is, there is a point at which Sobukwe is accused, and this is all recorded in the... Sobukwe is accused of having called for the killing and expulsion of whites. Mm. And of, opposes this, objects vehemently. He says mm. this never happened. But the accusation continues. And this is an accusation made in a British newspaper. It's, it's the British trying to tarnish his reputation. Mm. And they say, no, 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 this man has asked for the killing and expulsion of whites from South Africa. Mm. What then happens is that Sobukwe takes legal action against that British newspaper. He wins the case. And, and the basis on which he wins the case is, is by establishing that he has never called for the expulsion and the genociding of whites. Sure. And now most of us would be puzzled by this, right? Because most of us are taught in the sort of PAC yeah. tradition sure. that talks yeah. about driving whites into the sea. Sure. You know? And yet what we forget is to humanize Sobukwe. Sure. He was a complete human being. His belief about South Africa, once you accept the boundaries of the country, yeah. because there was also a big debate about whether Africa should accept the colonially imposed boundaries of uh, uh, sure. uh, uh, the Berlin, okay. Berlin Conference, yeah. 1885-1886. What he actually believed, firstly, is the concept of a, one human race. But... The fact that people can stay in this country provided they pay allegiance, right, to African leadership. What he opposed was the domination, the arrogance of whiteness. Mm. Mm. But ultimately, the idea that what was the speech here is a tree. So the mm. idea of a large African tree mm. and under which every race, so called, could belong, provided mm. we all start afresh, right? Provided we return the land. And again, mm. Sobuko should not be mistaken as a kind of a teddy bear. Sure. The proviso was always that what was stolen had to be returned. Mm. So we go back to the source. Sure. And thereafter, we pay allegiance to African sure. leadership. Sure. But thereafter, all of us belong. Ah, and then. Let's come. We, I mean, we 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 we've spoken um, under your work. Uh, you know, um, you as an academic, and then you as an author, and of course, primarily a lot of people we know you as lawyer, and uh, yeah. and, and 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 you have been involved in so many. Unfortunately, we cannot touch all of this in so many cases. Um, that of course, there are those that did not make the headlines but there are those that made the headlines. <laughs> and um, <laughs> what are one or two cases that for you just stand out and uh, pay back the money? Yeah, let me actually think about that. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, I mean, I, I do think that those, it's the trilogy. I mean, Dalim Bofo always talks about the trilogy. It's the okay. trilogy. This is the trilogy of, 2016. Um, I think sure. those are all 2016 cases. The trilogy of sure. 2016. It's, it's, it's of course Mganza itself. You know, yeah. uh, which paid back the money. Yeah. But it's also the the release of the state capture report. Sure. You know? sure. Um, yeah. And then it's the impeachment. That's the trilogy of 2016. Mm. But mm. I think that the case that probably stands out now, maybe because it's more recent. I think it was when the soldiers went to Alex and killed Collins Corsa. Mm -hmm. I, 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 I just mm -hmm. struggled to wrap my head around the brutality, the subsequent denials by the minister, the lies that were told by, by the soldiers, and the, the torture that they subjected him to. 
and the sheer indifference to the suffering of not only because he was black, but also because he was poor. I think Collins Cosa's case is really a stain in the uh, fabric of the Democratic Republic, I, 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 particularly in the context where everyone has been told to stay mm. home, cannot work. Sure. They're forced at home. Once they do stay at home, I mean, the judge found, and that was the evidence, uncontested. The mm. man had been in his yard. He had been drinking his own alcohol in his yard. Mm. He had done nothing to provoke the soldiers. Sure. They went inside his yard. They told him to take his alcohol to the house, which he did. Hmm. But they wanted him to open his fridge after that. Now, if you look at those factual findings, totally uncontested, sure. and thereafter, they just assaulted him. They went on and on and on. Now, that basically takes you back to the memories of Shabvir of June 16, of, sure. uh, uh, of Langa. Sure. It is the repetition of the conduct of the apartheid security sure. apparatus. Sure. And that, I think, is, is one case that I, I mean, I met with that family. I met with the, with the wife. I, I, I saw them in my office literally crying, just unable, you know, and you feel as a lawyer, you know, I know it's, of course, in court, put up the performance, at least one person must be strong, you know, not, not all of us could be crying in court. But you feel totally helpless when you have a family from Alex who've come to unburden themselves about the way, and it's totally random. It's, mm. you know, when you come to think, it's, you know, in a, it's a, it's a book by Anna Arendt, uh, the, the uh, a Jewish woman who left, um, uh, Europe and went to settle in America called banality of evil. You know, when, mm. when evil just becomes natural, it yeah. becomes banal, it becomes impossible. Because when something horrific like that happens, I mean, if you are the Collins Cossar's uh, common law wife, you're sitting with your husband, she gets roughed up by the cops, they start hitting him, and then they leave him. And then three hours later, he starts coughing blood and then ultimately collapses and dies. You, you, you want to know, like, what has he done? And maybe there is some other justification. Maybe he is mm. to blame for it. Mm. But when the entire story is told, and what you realize is that this death is a totally pointless death. It's a total waste of life. It's banal, mm. you know. And that's why I, I just think that that, that case is, is for me the, the most harrowing story. And, uh, you know, that it happened and that the minister subsequently ducked and dived and protected the soldiers and created false stories and then subsequently claimed that he had been misled by the soldiers. Mm. I, I just think that it's very, very difficult to sure. understand. This. So that's the case that, that really does get Get my blood boiling, actually. Huh, okay, all right. So let's let's let, and and look. And then the first time I got to know about uh, you and senior council, I think you had tweeted or retweeted Nelson Mandela uh, Foundation's uh, congratulatory note to you. I'm not sure. I think I saw their congratulatory note, or I saw your you retweeting it, or, or, or something. Were you expecting that eight years? Yeah. Your I mean, I, I suppose you have to have a bit of a sort of gumption to put in an application after eight years, you know, when you know that the rule oh. is 12 years. Oh. <laughs> 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 I think what's happening here? Oh, you just, yeah. <laughs> so, like, okay, you know what? I'm just going to put it in, you know, so let me see what happens. No, I mean, yeah. y y y did I expect it? I mean, <laughs> I mean, in a sense, you know, one would say, well, well why did you apply then if you're not expecting it, etc. Yeah, sure. I mean, what had happened, actually, perhaps that would be better if I just tell you sure. the, the story of what transpired. When they finished the applications, I mean, everybody at least knows of the cases that get advertised, and, uh, and, and many people know that uh, basically the past 10 years I've, 
I've run many, many, many cases uh, for many, yeah. many people, and a lot of them more prominent than others. Yeah. But that's been the so-called nine wasted years. The it was the Zuma Zuma period, and sure. and that period actually was a boon, if I can put it like that, for litigation, because there were just so many mistakes that the government was making. So, um, and so, of course, there was then in that period the emergence of the EFF, which did focus a lot on litigating uh, Zuma's mistakes, etc. Sure. But when the when the applications were closed in the year I turned seven at the bar, um, a colleague came to me and said, "I think that you should apply next year," so, which I thought. Okay, a bit, little bit tricky, but you know, what's he up to? And so I always thought at the end of that process that I would consider an application seriously um, in the following year, which is eight years. It It's still, I mean, you know, it's still a little bit, you know, confident to say, okay, eight years I'll do it because the rule is quite clear. Everyone knows the rule is advertised on the website. It's 12 years, so period, you know. So, 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 so. And then in the year then I was eight, um, that same colleague came up to me and said, okay, China, we're doing this thing now. And I avoided him, you know, ducked and dived, ducked and dived. But on the last day of the applications, two women, um, one of whom had been my pupil and her friend, um, who are advocates at the bar, then came to me and they said, look, if you don't apply, we're going to apply for you. And what we're going to do, we're going to give you the form and you will put your signature. And the application is going in today because it's the closing date. Mm. And they then went around asking, and at the time I was totally kept ignorant of it. Sure. They had, in fact, gone around asking for letters of support and letters of recommendations. Wow. And there were just many of them. There were just many. And they had gone to judges in the Constitutional Court and etc. At which point, I then started thinking, actually, this is not my application. It's not my application alone. I mean, of course, you know, it is still my, but it's not my application alone. But it has come to represent something bigger and something much really? more important. Mm. And that, in fact, I should stop being selfish. I should apply, put my name through, and go through the process like everybody else, which I did. And as they say, the rest is history. I'm still ducking your question as to whether I expected <laughs> it or not. You don't have to answer it. <laughs> it's okay. I'm not going to put you through that. And, uh, <laughs> now, 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 let me release you from part. But anyway, my uh, 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 congratulations, Mr. Bam. Congratulations. That was no, history. You. And no, um, you. like you said, that was not just uh, 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 Advocate Tembeka Ngurai Tobi's uh, uh, application and subsequent, uh, 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 you know, victory, but 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 so many people's uh, interests were there as well, you know. And as we say, it takes the village to to raise a child. Speaking about the village, speaking about the village, surely you, I'm one of those people that dismiss the myth of self-made success, self-made men. And uh, we are here because so many people um, invested on who we are. And uh, it takes the village to raise a child, Tembeka Ngai Tobi being that child. Who are some of the villagers that contributed to 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 Tembeka, that teacher, that that pastor, that colleague, that lecturer. Who are the people? Of course, there are many people. One or two, three, four people that you'd like to mention. Yes, I think that. Okay, firstly, I mean, I already mentioned uh, Mrs. Mkumatela. Yeah, yeah. She taught me at sub A. Yeah, taught me how to hold a pen. We we didn't have pens, by the way. We had slates. Aria. Yes. <laughs> You know, it's like it's amazing how there's progress, but there's no progress. 
because sure. the slate looks like a tablet. A tablet, precisely. That's so true. Yeah. Yeah. So I think the person who taught me how to hold it and how to, you know, uh, 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 write. Like, at the time, it was cursive writing, but, you know, still important how to connect the words. Um, we, I mean, without whom, actually, I, I think that if, if we didn't have someone with the patience and the encouragement, you know, everybody passed in Mrs. Mkumatela's class. If mm. you didn't deserve to pass, you would be sent to Ue Omkul. <laughs> I remember that. <laughs> <laughs> that was a way of telling you that actually you're not ready to go to B. <laughs> <laughs> I remember that. <laughs> so, so, which was, you know, quite good because all of us then felt as if we were being promoted at the end of the day. So it's probably her that was okay. most important in my in my life. But there was also another... Yeah. Can I make it, just before you go to the next one, let me quickly plug in my, my, my laptop is about to die now. Just give me a no second. No problem at all. No problem, I'll just hang tight. Otherwise, this was no, gonna end. No, we, 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 we've, gone more than, uh, we've gone way beyond the, the hour. And uh, I guess, oh, there you are. Sorry about that. No, that's fine. You do what you have to do. Okay, cool. Sorry, guys, about that, but we needed to make sure that this does not end. Okay, continue. And yeah. then the second the second villager? Yeah, and the other person I really can think of is my pr primary school teacher who taught me English. Um, and her name, I think, was Mrs. Mkuba. She taught me English. Um, I still remember her classes vividly. You know, we did the tenses, you know, we knew the difference between uh, uh, present tense, future tense, uh, future perfect tense, all of the seven tenses. But, mm. And then, because she was so crucial in, because language is crucial, you know. Uh, I mean, I obviously started it's a course, you know, and became yeah. quite good at it. But I think that without the grasp of English, it would have been a real struggle. And if I had not grasped the language, because the language was the instrument through which I could grasp the subjects. You sure. know? So the language played two roles. You know, The one was as a subject, but it was also a medium. You know? So I think that she's, she was very, very important. At university, I went to UNITRA at the um, University of Transkei. The reason I mentioned UNITRA is, and everywhere I go, I always want to emphasize because I subsequently went to two right. other universities yeah. after Rhodes University and the London School of Economics and Political Science. And I find these days when I talk about my education, a lot of people focusing on Rhodes or focusing on the London School of Economics, but both of which were all postgraduate uh, studies sure. that I did. People forget the undergraduate studies, which is really where your character is built. Mm. I have to mention UNITRA because it was primarily a black faculty, right? a black faculty. We got to know about legal research, about legal publishing, about practice, about being a lawyer and an advocate and all through the media of black lecturers. Sure. Not only because they were interested in teaching us, which was their job, they got paid for it, but they also had a deep cultural interest in our success. So they invested, emotionally invested, and they became worried when we didn't succeed. Uh -huh. This is a huge distinction I always experience these mm. days going essentially to white universities where the education of the black child is a transactional affair, mm. but mm. not an in-depth cultural affair, sure. which is intended at transforming a person into a contributor to society. Sure. That's the one thing about my lecturers there. I can mention some examples of people that did stand in front of me and taught me, et cetera. 
One of them was today is an advocate, Dumis and Sabeza. Mm. Another was today is a judge of the Supreme Court of Appeal. In fact, the president of the Supreme Court of Appeal, Mandy Samaya, mm. uh, who taught me, Judge Mandy Samaya taught me interpretation uh, of statutes. Right? There was Professor Dover. People don't know this, but one of the lecturers at UNITRA was Professor John Thorpe. Right. I didn't know that. Mm. Exactly. They don't know this. Mm. People also don't know that two of the members of the uh, Constitutional Court once taught at UNITRA. One did not teach me specifically, but taught there. Uh, professor Chris Chafter. Well, not Professor, was a lecturer there. Uh, Chris Chafter. Mm -hmm. They don't know uh, uh, Judge Mazanga also had time to teach at UNITRA. Mm -hmm. Now, what you find is a constellation of the cream of the transcribed legal profession sure. in one place, mm. which has subsequently come to play a much bigger role in the larger landscape of South Africa. Mm. One of the men who taught me, who in fact had written books himself, was Dick Bikoyan, Dick Bikoyan taught us two subjects. Mm. One was customary law. He had a sure. book and he had a well-accomplished publication record. And he also taught us, at the time, there was the Transkei Penal Code. So criminal procedure, but from the Transkei perspective. Now, all of this, the university was designed as a Bantustan outlet. Sure. But its lecturers transformed its Bantustan character into a contributor to lay the foundation for the new South Africa. Now, mm -hmm. this is why I feel Often when we talk about black universities, we do it without context. And mm. we do it in a derisive and dismissive way. Oh. And we forget the hundreds and hundreds of lawyers that have gone through the university. Whether you're talking about the medical faculty, you're talking about, but the fact of the matter is that for years in this country, black students could not get legal education other than through UNITRA or FOTE, you know, or University of Western Cape, or Devon Westfield or Teflop or Unizu. And so those black lecturers who were not teaching only on a transactional level, but were teaching on a cultural, emotional level, invested mm. in the development of the totality of the soul of the African children. Mm. We are missing them these days. Sure. We are missing them because we have really converted university education into a business. Sure. Right, And we are also missing them because we no longer have a scenario. And you know, uh, Sivu, this, for me, really this uh, topic about black investors truly uh, uh, bothers me. Sure. When concepts could not be explained in a law class, a unit, mm. you couldn't explain it in Latin, which was the language of law, nor could you explain it in English. What did you do? Ah. You went to Prosser, right? Ah. <laughs> so, <laughs> ah, mm. which actually meant everybody in the classroom actually understood the concept by the ah. end of the lecture, mm. right? Mm. And therefore, it stayed. Mm. You know, so we miss all of that. We miss the cultural connectivity between mm. the teacher and the taught. You know, and that dynamic is so crucial because I believe language is everything. Mm. speaking to a person in the language that they understand sure. not only enables the concept to stay in their head, but it hits them inside. Sure. Sure. Suddenly, they see sure. themselves as a player and a participant and not as a wow. foreigner wow. Into, the, into, the, into the discourse. You know? And so that's where I, I, I think my lecturers at, uh, at UNITRA, when I did my first year, wow. I got into yeah. to to Latin, to criminal procedure. I, I really want to uh, say those are probably the most important people that have ever taught me anything about critical thinking. And also these ideas of not, I mean, you know, in the law of um, property, right, which is what you receive from a book, whether it's written by Van der Waalt or Pinar, you know, the primary authors in property. Property is acquired through uh, prescription. After 30 years of occupying a piece of land, it belongs to you. Mm. It is also acquired by 
sale. But nothing is ever said about acquisition via conquest. But our lecturers, exactly. Wow. Now, but our lecturers brought this to life, you know, that mm, the law is itself built on a foundation of conquest. Mm. And so that element of situating law in the real world, today I see the, the people call that uh, uh, legal realism. Mm. There's a term like that which sure. is yeah. sometimes gets fashionable. But the fact of the matter is that we had lecturers that provided us a, a critical account of the slave origins of the law, right? Something I'm beginning to appreciate now is the connections between what we call labor law today and slavery. Mm. The fact that actually all of these laws come from apprenticeship. They transformed into masters and servants, and then they transformed into labor law, usually presented right in benign terms, but its origins lie in slavery. Same thing with constitutional law. What you find is that it's usually presented as a law of government, but never explained that this law of government is the rule of the conquered by the conquerors. Mm. And there's a way in which you can think about it differently. So it's that also that critical understanding of the law as it applies to black people. Mm. Right. So I, I really do think that's where we learned. Uh, and of course, life at UNITRA was a lot of fun uh, outside the classroom. Sure. I got to learn about Marx. I was a Marxist. I'm now a, Mar a lapsed a Marxist. I'm still a structuralist. <laughs> <laughs> but I, I, I think I've lapsed as a Marxist. Sure. I, I don't think I would have learned about Marxism anywhere else other than sure. uh, in the uh, political education classes of SASCO. You know, mm -hmm. uh, I learned about Gramsci as well. I didn't know about Gramsci and his theories. Uh, I learned about Lenin. I wouldn't have known about Lenin and his mm -hmm. theories. Those things were crucial, actually, in you know, forming me as a, as a human. So I really think that those four years at UNITRA were the most sure. formative. And I look back in those years with a lot of pride. Sure, sure. Of course, we, 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 you do know that um, we are concluding uh, September, Heritage Month, but for, for some of us, it's really more legal month. <laughs> 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 Uh, I, let me not say much after that. Let me just, yeah, <laughs> let me just end there. Yeah. And, um, I, 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 I did let you know that we were going to reflect on that. And, um, and you know, if we had time, I would have wanted us to, 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 you know, to reflect between the relationship between Biko and Sobukwe. The only one uh, recorded encounter where they, you know, they were in the same room is when uh, uh, Miko had just, I remember, had, had just entered the room and then he saw some book. Oh, I said, oh, no, she's a laugh, I can't. And, yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah. and uh, you like, know, that story was narrated recently at the funeral of uh, Umamu Veronica. Um, oh, no, by, no, it was narrated recently, actually, at the funeral of uh, Umamu Veronica by uh, uh, Sisinsi Kibiko. Oh, she okay. actually read a paper, a, a full speech, like four pages. Sure. And uh, she narrated that very encounter, um, mm. talking about it. In fact, there are more encounters in that speech that she gave explaining their relationship, uh, Sobukwe and, and, uh, and Biko's relationship. I mean, it sure. does appear that Sobukwe, I mean, Biko looked upon Sobukwe as a, sure. uh, an intellectual mentor. Sure. Um, as in a sense, foundational to to the philosophy of black consciousness was uh, was Pan Africanism. Yeah, um, I mean, you know, the, one of the strengths of Pan Africanism itself, as espoused by, by Sobuko, was that status campaign. And sure. if you actually look at the elements of the status campaign, it's strikingly similar to what subsubsequently yeah. became uh, black exactly. consciousness. Yeah. Like, now that you mentioned. Yeah, it was the idea of being proud in your blackness, being proud in your hair, being proud in sure. you know your languages, etc. And if you look at 
white party status campaign was uh, it has direct resonances to to Precisely. what black consciousness became as a philosophy. But of course, for Sobukwe, the status campaign was just an element of Pan Africanism. Pan Africanism was still much broader. I mean, he picked on the subject of the past as an, an embodiment of the control of the black body by a white sure. system. Sure. And then he targeted the past, which is what mm. the 21st of sure. March was, was about. But back to, back to Bigo, I admire Bigo. Uh, I admire him as a person and I admire his ideas and I admire his own personal sacrifice and the mm. fact that he actually resisted the system in a much more direct way. Uh, many of us do not have that courage of sure. a direct confrontation with the system. Biko was different. In fact, in the same way as Sobukwe, because you know, Sobukwe's speech that he gave to his comrades shortly before they began the, the, the walk through Mofono Street to you know, present themselves for arrest, was that we have to present ourselves as the leadership for arrest. We mm. have to be the first ones to scrap the passes sure. because the masses must follow our lead as our example. And sure. his example was the idea of personal sacrifice. In other words, put yourself in the place where you expect your followers to be. Obviously, sure. we don't have many politicians with that courage today. They'd rather yeah. their followers yeah. sure. put in the place of danger yeah. than themselves. You know, so, so. <laughs> But I think Bingo is also important for, for, for another reason, because Bingo enabled us to have the language, right? The language through which to express, because part of the problem that sometimes we experience is what is the language to express our own frustrations with conquest? And Bingo provided the platform, the linguistic platform, which was their consciousness uh, to collectively think about how to channel uh, the, uh, the, the resistance struggle. But he did something else as well, which was crucial. Many white people had the tendency throughout the struggle, not only in the 60s and the 70s when Bigo was alive, but throughout conquest, many white people positioned themselves as spokespersons of mm. black people. Mm. They position themselves as people who understand the pain of black people. Sure. And they position themselves as people who are best placed to articulate that pain. Mm. Mm. One can think of numerous examples. Mm. Here in the Cape, during the era of colonial conquest, when it was in its zenith, there was a man called John Philip, who was a Christian missionary. He sure. campaigned for the end of slavery, but he also campaigned for a better treatment of natives. Mm. But the reality is that underpinning John Phillips' contributions was the general acceptance of colonial conquest. Mm. But the fear that, ex exactly. But not yeah. its end, right? Sure. Not its total abolition, but sure. the fact that the natives were being harshly treated mm. and that there had to be different treatment meted to them. So in that sense, there was always a connection between those who spoke in favor of the natives and those who exercised control and domination of the natives. That spirit of John Philip, and one must not underestimate its failure, it, has, it was important, has lived through the years and through the centuries. When Bingo was alive, there were still white people and his mm -hmm. particular target was Nusas. Mm. Who, which was the National Union of uh, University Students of South Africa, primarily a white group of students who purported, using the language of liberalism, purported to speak in the interests of black students and in the interests of black people as a whole. Bigo's idea was to smash that sure. and to argue that black people did not need white people as their messiahs. I think that was his term. Uh, or white people as their spokesperson or representatives. Black people, in a sense, had to do it themselves. Now, of course, in the larger history of humanity, the idea of removing the spokesperson in Nietzsche's world, it was the removal of God and the replacement mm -hmm. in a notional sense and the replacement of God by the human. 
In other words, remove anything that purports to speak on your behalf and do it yourself. So in many respects, this language of removing the spokesperson and becoming your own liberator, there is a book today uh, by Dikhan Moseneke, someone that I admire. The book is called My Own Liberator. Listening to Dikhan Moseneke's explanations, what you find is Sobukwe multiplied, Migo multiplied. Sure. In the idea that if you want genuine freedom, you should not have interlocutors speaking for you. You should do it yourself. Mm. Ooh, it's hot here. Somebody has just said, uh, oh, um, what a remarkable conversation. And uh, uh, Viwem Chonchi was saying, let us build booths here uh, uh, and fund this. Um, look, let's, let, 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 let's quickly go through... Okay, I'm going to end with those questions, but I've got to ask you this because it, 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 it's very important. Your dream Africa. Yeah. How does it look like? Number one. Yeah. Number two. Number number two. What, in your opinion, stands between that Africa and us now? What needs to happen for that Africa to be realized? Yeah, this is most fascinating. You know, in um, when the Organization of African Union was established, I think this was in 1963. I mean, during the big, you know, decolonialization movement. I mean, they, sure. there have been phases of decolonization. We are in another phase now, but the big decolonization movement was in the 1960s, right? Beginning with, uh, I think, Ghana and many, many African states that then became quote unquote decolonized. But they still remained under imperialism, you know, even mm. if they were no longer colonists, they were still uh, under imperial control. One of the questions that had to be debated by the OAU was what should Africans do about the borders? Sure. Mm. Which was, you know, everyone looks at the borders and says, well, that's the source of you know, African problems. I mean, it might be an exaggeration because at the Berlin conference, I mean, the Cape itself had long been under the sphere mm. of British mm. rule. You know, the Berlin conference is quite late in the history of colonization of Africa. You know, uh, the Cape is essentially occupied from 1806 by the British. Yet the Berlin conference is only an 1885 event. But it's still significant for people in Central Africa and in Congo, you know, because they put the Congo under the influence of Leopold and he then Con continues to pillage and plunder the place and ultimately genocides 20 million Congolese or conservatively 10 million Congolese. So it's still crucial that became a turning point. Yet, when Africans were asked themselves sitting at the OAU, what do they want about the borders? Their decision was to keep the borders, was to keep the colonially imposed borders. And I see that it is extremely difficult to reverse the borders as a practical issue. Part of it is that the establishment of the borders created two enclaves. One was a nation state enclave, right? The other was an ethnic enclave because the creation of a nation state in Africa, unlike in Europe, came with an uh, imposed from the top idea of an ethnic group. European ethnic groups grew from below, right? They grew mm -hmm. naturally. But African ethnic groups were just imposed. So one day you woke up and you were told that the area from Mzimkulu to Port Elizabeth is Tosa land. Even though within that area, there are so many different languages and so many different dialects. In this area that was called Tosa land, now people speak Sotho, Zulu, Bata, um, whatever variants of Tosa. In the same area called Zululand, they just imposed it and that became the area. So the problem we still have to grapple with is the problem of ethnicity. So what does Africa look like? Firstly, we have to grapple with the problem of ethnicity. And ethnicity is also crucial as a vehicle towards so-called economic emancipation. And ethnicity was the key instrument that the Europeans used in division and conquer because they created ethnic groups. The fact that today I'm called so-called Kosa is not 
by a result of some kind of ethnic identification that I have chosen. My own people, actually, old people, regarded themselves as Mbondo Mise and never, in fact, associated with Kosa people who are today either Talega or Khakhabe or whatever, mm. right? But the fact of the matter is that they are all put together and there is an externally imposed definition that they will all be regarded as Kosa. So I really do think that the key challenge for Africa in this century, as you know, Du Bois said that uh, the, uh, the problem of the uh, 19th century, 20th century yeah. rather, was the problem of the Calabar. I do think the problem of the 21st century is the problem of ethnic identity. Wow. Whew. Okay. Um, I've got to ask you this. Why are you as successful as you are? Um, I mean, to accept, I suppose. I mean, you know why I'm asking that question, right? I mean, we spoke about it earlier this morning. And, you know, you know, sometimes, especially as Africans, we like to mystify things, you know, favor. Of course, favor, you know, there's an element of favor. And, 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 but, but, but there has got to be repeatable steps that, that can be replicated in somebody else's life. And, uh, and I'm asking for that. And, uh, you know, for younger people that are watching, younger lawyers and younger yes. professionals that want to excel yes. in their different fields. And this is, yes, we do. There's a place for prayer. Yes, there's a place for favor. Yes, there's a place of you for blessing. Yes, but there's got to be the other practical side as well. Talk to me about that. Why are you successful? And, and, and I'm not asking if you are successful. I'm telling you, you are, Tim Berger. Why are you <laughs> Yeah, I, I, yeah, okay. Look, I, I think that you've, you've, you've actually cornered me. You are an excellent cross-examiner. <laughs> so, so, so. Thank you. So I, I'm a cornered witness, so I need to give you an answer. Yeah. I tell you this. My own belief in whatever you do, whether you're a doctor or a lawyer or an engineer, whatever, it doesn't matter what it is, is that your talent will probably only take you maybe at most 30% of the way, but probably around 10% of the way. Your natural talent, in other words, you are gifted. What lawyers do, they do three things. And those who are lawyers here, or whatever, they must remember this. Lawyers do three things. They talk, they write, and they read. Those are the three things that they do primarily. They read many things, they speak about many things, and they write many different things. But those are the key critical skills that they need to get. So. The key is to excel in these three elements. If you cannot speak, maybe try and excel in writing. If you cannot write, maybe try and, and excel in speaking. Or if you can't do those, try and excel in reading because comprehension is actually quite key. But how do you do it? So I've identified the core, the core skills you need as a lawyer is to speak, to write, and to read. But how does one go about this? Now, I don't know what the menu is. I can tell you what I do, you know, and people can then decide for themselves what they want. In so far as a specific case is concerned, talk about a practical example of a specific case. Your talent is of limited value. It's 10% of the way. The rest of it is work, work, work. And it's mainly repetition. It's doing the same thing over and over again. If you have to argue a case, most of the work, maybe 70, 80% is preparation. The delivery is an hour or two hours, but that means you are compressing work over a period of two weeks or over a period of a week or over a period of a couple of days, but it was to be compressed within an hour, which means that you have to spend most of your time in practicing and preparation and repeating doing it. Arguing a case should not be a complicated exercise. Remember this, the judges are human. You are not only talking to their brains, you're also talking to their heart. They move with the human story. So tell them the human story. You can always interpose uh, with the legal analysis. But I find that many lawyers spend a lot of time on explaining what the law is. Assume the judge knows the law. That is why they're a judge, right? What they don't know 
which you are intimately familiar with, is why is your client in court, mm. right? But also the reason of telling your client's story is to give homage and respect to your client. So to make your client feel that his case has been heard and represented in court. So I make one example. Take the case of Collins Cross, a case I argued. You could have opened that case. I was given two hours to argue the case, but I'd been leaving the case for at least three weeks before, right? Because it had been three weeks since I had met them and understood their story and asked them questions and questioned and questioned them and then tried to explore the different aspects of the case. But I'm given two hours to tell the judge why I should win. You can start that case either by explaining what the constitution provides, but immediately do that the judge goes to sleep because he has been 50 years in the practice and he has read the constitution more times than you have. What he does not know is what happened on the day that Collins Cosa was murdered by the soldiers. So you begin your narrative. On X date, Mr. Mr. Cosa was with his wife at home drinking inside his property. Four soldiers walked in. They gave him an instruction to walk into the kitchen. Once he was inside the kitchen, they instructed him to open the fridge. Now, suddenly, you've captured the attention of the judge. So make the case about your client. Put the client at the center of the narrative, right? So again, this is something that anyone can repeat and anyone uh, can do. Now, talking about speaking, there is one thing I do, and I'm not, I know I should be embarrassed about it, but I'm not. If I'm going to argue an important case, and I know that I have 45 minutes to say everything I want to say, and usually at the Constitutional Court, you have 45 minutes to say everything you want to say. Literally speaking, I write out my notes. And a day or two before the actual day of the hearing, I read them out and I put a mirror. I read them out and I go through what I am going to say. I'm going to say this, this and that. And I will look. Sometimes I'll find that to say everything I want to say is going to take me an hour, which means I need to find 15 minutes to cut. And then sometimes I think maybe I would actually be allowed only 30, 30 minutes, which means I need another 15 minutes to cut. And I've done this exercise many times. There was a case where I believed I was going to be given 40 minutes, but I practiced for three scenarios. The scenario one is if I get 40 minutes. Scenario two is if I get 30 minutes. And scenario three is if I get 20 minutes. I got 10 minutes. Wow. And on scenario two, which I had arranged for 20 minutes, I then used that hour when I was waiting for my 10, because I was acting for an amicus curia, that hour, to say, in the 10 minutes that I have, what is the most impactful things that I'm going to say to the judges, right? And again, Look at the mirror. If you don't like what you see, assume the judge also doesn't like what he sees. So, but anyway, you're getting me started on this. So <laughs> I would say three things that one must remember. Remember the core skills that we use as a lawyer. We read, we write, and we speak. Read many, many things. Do not read only the law. Read books about philosophy, books about language, books about history, books about politics, but read many things. It is only if you read widely that you can write better because writing comes from reading. No other way, it comes from reading. And then the art of speaking also comes from reading because it is only when you read widely that you know what the impact of speaking would be. Oh, okay, thank you, my man. <laughs> Put it here. <laughs> you see? <We> told you. <laughs> I know it was all about to know. happen. <laughs> you know my <laughs> this is brilliant. Uh, okay, so the, that's the third element of it is speaking. Yeah. Which again comes from reading. And then if you are going to talk about how to present a case, remember this the presentation itself is only. 10% of what you have to do, the balance of it is preparation of what you have to do. Sure. So 
those are the core skills that I think people must remember, but this is also the technique that I think you should remember. All right. Uh, thanks, man. Look, let's. Uh, uh, somebody has just commented, Kupaki. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> Which is true. <laughs> Which is true. Well, my, 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 my nephews actually think I have to eat at some point. It's yeah. Awesome. yeah. <laughs> it's like this guy has been keeping you. Hold on. Let me just quickly go through two questions and then we'll wrap this thing up. Um, uh, Uh, okay, L Lula, I must say, it, it, it is a great honor to have you advocating Guy Toby today on this platform. Our justice system is very much promising to have young people like you. Abasa Mele Obulungisa in our country, so inspirational to me. And uh, and then, and, and Uyem Yem Kamata Jola, Jola is multi-talented, legal guru, academic, and a prolific author on the most uncomfortable subjects, land and sobukwe, great inspiration indeed for black excellence. Is related. The Africa. Uh, the Africa. Uh, now, what, what is the better grounding approach for lawyers between one, going straight for advocacy pupillage, and two, being admitted as attorneys uh, for a few years or so before advocacy pupillage? I mean, you would know that question. Uh, do you want to answer that? Yeah, I mean, I think there is no straight answer to this. Uh, for some people, it works to go straight to pupillage. Um, others, it's better to become an attorney and then to do advocacy later. I became an attorney first and then I went to, to pupillage. It worked for me, but I know many, many successful people who did pupillage straight from university and they you know, have been excelling as advocates. So I, I think it's just a, a question of choice. There isn't one way. I mean, if you do become an attorney, the one thing I would advise you is that you should go to the bar as soon as possible. Don't stay for too long. Okay. Uh, another one. You are Bayanda Lakwela. You are an inspiration to many of us advocating right Toby. Practicing advocate, a teacher, academic, columnist, and lifetime researcher who produces books. What is your secret to this usefulness? Uh, <laughs> no, there is no secret. I mean, anyone, basically anyone can do this. Um, there's, there's really no secret. Uh, anyone can do this. If you've got to find, I mean, you've got to find things that interest you, you know, things that you love doing, things that you're passionate about, you know. Nothing kills creativity than lack of passion. You've got to be interested in what you do. You know, if, mm. if you have no interest and no love for it, then abandon it. Don't waste your time. You know, that's what sure. I find. I find a lot of people who, who say that they want to write books, but then they have no interest in writing or reading or researching, mm. you know, or, or that they have no interest in the book that they want to write about, you know. So sure. if you want to know about, you know, what book to write, the key for me is not you know, to think about what book is popular. I mean, I, I've been researching The Land is Ours for five, six years. When I published it, it just coincided with the fact that the country was moving into a particular direction. Mm -hmm. But you've got to write about the subject that animates you. You know, they, they, in other words, if you go to a bookshop and you find there's a book that is missing, that you cannot find, that's the book you must write. That's the book that you went looking for and you couldn't find in the bookshelves because nobody has written about it. And so, mm -hmm. so that's the book you really, really need to, to, to write about. Do not allow mm -hmm. yourself to be driven by what appears to be popular sentiment or to be driven by the so-called market. You've got to create the market yourself. You know? so, sure. so write something that, that speaks to you, that interests you. That's, that's what, what people want to read. They want to read stories. If you find mm -hmm. it interesting, other people most likely will also find it interesting. Sure, sure. sure. Thanks, man. Uh, uh, Pastor Nechaflani Chumara says, a south wind is gathering momentum from this corner to the rest of the continent. Mm. Uh, somebody has said, uh, what a remarkable, I'm, I'm just trying to get through some. Uh, okay, yes, quick question. Uh, what advice can you give to law students? Some words of encouragement? Probably... Yeah, I mean, we need many lawyers. We, we need many lawyers. We've got very few lawyers in this country. I think we have only 4,000 advocates. If you think about a country like the States, which people usually say is over-lawyered, 
but if you look at the proportions, how many lawyers to how many people in this country? Mm. So you'll find that a population that has 58 million people, but only 4,000 advocates, total disproportionate, completely disproportionate. Sure. Sure. If you look on the attorney side, the last time I checked the numbers, it was 20,000 attorneys, but it's still totally disproportionate sure. to the size of the country. Sure. So we need more and more people. When they do study law, we are even short on the human rights side. A lot of people want to study law and they want to go into commercial law. That is all mm -hmm. fine. I did my bit as well. And so there's no criticism there. But anyone who tells you that this country is overpopulated in relation to lawyers is not telling you the truth. The fact of the matter mm -hmm. is there is a shortage. It's obviously about being in the right place at the right time and doing the right subjects and focusing on the right areas of law, etc. But just on the basic numbers, 4,000 advocates compared to 58 million people that must be served by lawyers. There is a grave shortage. So if you are looking for something to study, I would definitely encourage LLB studies. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, man. Well, let's keep it light. Thank you, man. This, this, was, this, was, this was quite huge. And uh, like I said, uh, I can't wait for, for the lockdown to be completely and then we are uh, gone and we can gather in person, have live audience and have these conversations with our continent's change makers. Let's keep it light. Last five questions for the, your, your favorite African destination? I've, I think it has to be Nairobi. Nairobi, Nairobi. Ah, sure. Yeah, sure. Nairobi, ah, yeah. Uh, yeah, there were just so many similar things that were striking and interesting and great people, lovely people and yeah. And also the place naturally is also beautiful, but uh, I won't say the thing about, you know, uh, Africa being, you know, <laughs> a place of wild animals, etc. I mean, that's like, <laughs> yeah, yeah, I love no, no, no. the people of Kenya. I, I think sure, Nairobi. Sure. Sure. Um, and, 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 and your favorite dish doesn't have to be African, but your favorite uh, dish, meal? Well, at the moment, I'm looking at, um, I think this is sweet potato, some veggies. I can't work out whether this meat is um, is chicken or what, but I, I'll go through. So, but it's tripe. Ah. <laughs> <laughs> tripe, I understand. I understand. <laughs> uh, <laughs> Uh, I'm, I'm not sure if we're gonna have. I'm not sure if we're gonna have it there where we're gonna have the breakfast tomorrow. But, uh, but <laughs> no, we, I doubt it. They will. I mean, they, I, they will have an English English breakfast. I know. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I know. Um, and then and then, what are you currently reading? I know you're reading some. Uh, um, but what are no, you currently I'm reading? Not yet, but what I'm currently reading um, because it is here uh, in my bed. Um, it's actually an interesting book about uh, yes uh, it's called Breaking the Chains Slavery and Its Legacy in the 19th Century Cape Colony so wow. I'm, I'm reading you see where I am, I'm halfway through you know, I've sure. been sure. reading about uh, the, the slave Slave, slavery in the Cape Colony, particularly on the Eastern Cape side of the, uh, sure. of the Cape. Who's that? And yeah. uh, the book is written by, it's edited actually by Nigel Warden and uh, Clifton Crace. It's an old book. I mean, I tend to read uh, older books. Uh, I mean, it's, it's been most fascinating to me because slavery is a subject that is almost forgotten as if it never happened. And yet the Western Cape particularly is founded on slavery. And perhaps there is some evidence in KZN as well of the Delagoa slave trade. But slavery in the Eastern Cape is a totally unknown subject. Uh, mm. And yet there's clear evidence in places like Hrafrenet, massive slave trade. I mean, slavery, in other words, the external importation of slaves into South Africa was banned in 1806. Sure. But slavery itself ended in 1834 
The question is what happened in that 30 years? You know, that's where internal slavery mm. becomes uh, quite prominent. So, so this is one of the books I've been reading on the subject of slavery. Sure, sure. And cool. I'm and, not and, writing and, anything about this, I'm just reading. <laughs> But 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 you can't rule it out, huh? You never know. <laughs> <laughs> you can't rule no, no, it out. The Fubuka project is much more urgent. <laughs> yes, no, no, definitely, definitely, definitely. Um, and 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 and. Uh, and, and and I really thank God that you've actually taken the time to to research his his his, his life. Yeah. And um, music, favorite artist, favorite album, or favorite song. I think Brenda Farsi by far is. The, it's my wow. most favorite. Uh, yeah, most favorite. And, and, and it's very difficult to choose amongst Brenda's songs. Um, I know. And there was one special which played when I was a kid. And, you know, um, oh my, my aunt, I'll tell you something else now. That we are on the subject. My, sure. So my mother uh, took me to live with my aunt. Sure. When my, when my father died, uh, basically there's three of us. She doesn't have a real job. She's hustling and so she doesn't have the ability to look after all of us. She then asked my aunt to take me on and I go there as a whatever, seven, eight year old. And uh, then get raised in Umtata. My aunt is then a Shibin queen. Sure. Um, and then, you know, uh, at a house at number 121, General Spilken Street. Most fascinating part of my upbringing is basically helping her, you know, to sell alcohol. Hmm. And over weekends, she would be blasting music away. And the artist I fell in love with then, I mean, was Brenda Farsi, because hmm. everyone was always in a cheerful mood and dancing sure. when Brenda sure. was playing. Sure. And um, so there are many, many songs that, you know, I can think about. There's obviously Weekend Special. Everyone knows about that. I was going to ask you to sing that. <laughs> 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 I'm not Weekend, I'm not weekend Special. Yeah, um, there, there's, there's another one, actually, that I can't think of right now. Um, but if I do think about it before we end the... Uh, there was another Brenda Foster song at the time, actually, which... I absolutely loved. Um, I remember this because my cousin loved the song. Uh, so anyway, Brenda would be one of them. Okay. And who else would it be? I mean, my mother, I'm told, actually loved Percy Sledge. And I actually used to listen to Percy Sledge. It's like the funniest things, like, you know, whatever. It's like a random thing, you know, it's like, you know, a blast from the 50s, you know. Like, you sure. know? So, so I ultimately ended up listening to, to Percy Sledge as well. In terms of today's uh, artists, I mean, I think many, I, I hope that many uh, women and feminists listening on this program will forgive me for, for this choice. But there are two artists that I really like listening to. One of them is Java. Okay. And I thought you were going to say R. Kelly. Uh, no, 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 no. The one of them is Strava. Yeah. So. Sure. <laughs> so, so, so the fact that I've chosen Java, you know, might get me into trouble, but I, I think I'll sure. ask for forgiveness uh, in advance. Uh, the other is um, is Casper. Uh, oh, wow. Yeah, so, okay. so, so those are the two that uh, I love sure. now, sure. Uh, particularly Java. I, I think is absolutely brilliantly talented. Yeah, he's, he's obviously his own mistakes, and uh, I hope his situation gets sorted out. Yeah, and then somebody has just, um, uh, uh, I don't know who enjoyed this conversation more between me and my daughter, so inspired, and um, and and, and uh, this was very informative. Um, I'm empowered today. I wish our sons and daughters are listening in this powerful conversation. And lastly, this has been a rich conversation. Thanks once again to the Real Village for these dialogues. Thank you guys for joining us. This has, this has actually been, okay, let's end it now. It's two hours. Can you believe it? I don't know where the time went. Sure me, guys. And, and, and tell me your favorite quote, man. You, 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 I mean, you, you, you speak a lot, and, but 
you know, your favorite quote or mantra uh, by which you live? Yeah, I mean, I suppose, um, I, yeah, to actually think of a quote, I mean, I generally speaking don't use, you know, the quotes as, you know, to define uh, sure. how I live. I mean, the one I have had and uh, I thought was meaningful, and I'm not saying it is my favorite, was sure. some, I don't know by who, you know, something that said, live this day as if it is your last. Mm. Mm. And I, I really do think that's that's absolutely significant. I really do think that you've got to live each day as as if there's no tomorrow. Um, sure. That, of course, doesn't mean you must be irresponsible. It actually sure. means you should be responsible. It sure. is as if uh, I lost my aunt, the aunt who raised me in 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 Kwezi Township in Mtaza. I lost her in 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 April this year. But uh, I felt no regrets, nothing whatsoever, because I, you know, believed that I had done everything that I could for her when she was alive. And, and in fact, that was the general sense I got from my sister as well, from my brother, is that sure. uh, we, we, we had really gone out and spent time mm -hmm. with her, looked after her, et cetera. And no one knew, I mean, she just, you know, uh, went to hospital three days later, she yeah. was gone. And mm -hmm. I think that if we had held back in giving, we would have probably, sure. you know, regretted that we didn't do much yeah. during her time. Sure. Than, and so it's, it's I think uh, at her death, that, that saying that uh, living each day as if it, it is your last actually gained a lot of meaning for me personally. And it's, you know, uh, someone asked me because, or if you look on my WhatsApp, so her picture is is the one I have on my yeah. WhatsApp. Yeah. Oh, okay. Sure. Yeah. Someone asked me, you know, who is this beautiful lady on your WhatsApp uh, WhatsApp state, uh, status? So I said, no, this is my aunt. And then, but that still doesn't actually explain because it's English. It's actually yeah. my surrogate mother. Sure. Sure. Yeah. Sure. Exactly. 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 Yeah. Exactly. Exactly. <laughs> exactly. So <laughs> it's believe exactly. 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 that she really played surrogate mother since I was nine until basically I became a, a man, you know, I could go yeah. to my mother when I was fully formed. So I, yeah. I, I think this saying made a lot of sense for me personally when when she when she died. I'm with you. Thanks, man. Thanks. Guys, thank you so much. And um, Advocate Temega Nguraitobi, thank you so much for your time. And, um, and thank you for graciously giving us two of your precious hours and um, actually giving those to the African child and, and, and inspiring them. Thank you for your story. And it has only just started. The best well, is yet to come. Yeah, thank you for this invitation. I, I really do wish to say that the program you've begun, I went through your website sure. and I was personally inspired by the work that you do. Sure. And that's why when I was here, I thought, actually, let me just go to this guy's studio. I didn't sure. realize that. <laughs> <laughs> so, that, so that I actually gave him an authentic conversation sure. because yeah. you're doing very inspirational work. I have no doubt that there are many young people who actually want to do what you are doing. In other words, who want to give hope and inspiration to many others. And we may not say it, but you've got to remember that we are watching every step that you are making with a lot of pride. Uh, as African people, that there is actually someone who is doing this on an authentic basis and advertising this work. This is not giving someone money, but sure. it's much more crucial to give people hope sure. that there is a better tomorrow. Sure. And what you are doing actually leaves most of us with a lot of hope that is, there is, in fact, Thank a you. better tomorrow. So for the future, I will be more than willing to play any role that you wish I could play in, you know, promoting your organization, making it successful, or whatever you think, you know, I could usefully, you know, do in your organization. For all of the uh, Sobukwe supporters who have been watching, he's late. He's late. <laughs> thank you. We've already spoken about your role, and thank you so, and, and so much for graciously accepting it. And uh, and thank you so much, man. I'm gonna put you backstage, and then I'll I'll be with you now. Uh, guys, thank you so much. And um, 
in the words, uh, oh, by the way, next week we are starting a new month and our first guest is uh, the cricketing legend, Makaya Ntini, and uh, he's going to be joining us next week and uh, we're looking forward to that. Have a good evening. We took This took long, but you guys stayed with us. This could only mean that you enjoyed it. And uh, in the words of Robert Mangaliso Sobukwe, remember Africa. May God bless you.